And this afternoon's uh, talk is going to be demystifying the immune workup in primary immune deficiency. Um, my name is William Blue, and I'm a nurse practitioner, and I am the chairman of the IDF's Nurse Advisory Committee. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, a couple of people that um, I've known for a while. One of them I've known for a very long while, um, so I'm going to introduce her first. Um, it's Dr. Vivian Hernandez Trujillo. She's been my uh, director in allergy and immunology and my friend for a very long time. Um, she is the division chief at the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami. Um, she's also the fellowship and uh, training program director of the uh, immunology program that we have at uh, Children's, um, and she's the, the founder of that, really. Um, and she is the associate professor at uh, Herbert Wertheim School of Medicine at FIU in Florida. Um, and she also is in private practice at Allergy and Immunology Care Centers of South Florida. Um, she's uh, extensively published, and she is one of my favorite people, and um, she will be speaking with you guys uh, this afternoon. And then um, Mark Rydell, who I've had the opportunity and pleasure to speak with at some IDF things in the past. Mark is a professor of medicine and the clinical director of the U.S. Uh, uh, HAE Angioedema Center. Um, he's also a fellowship and training program director of the Division of Rheumatology, Allergy and Immunology at the University of California in San Diego. And um, these two very learned and wonderful folks will help demystify the immune workup in PI for you all. Um, if there are questions, if you guys would hold them till the end. And uh, without further ado, it's up to you guys. Thank you. Thanks, William, for that kind introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to this session. Um, Vivian and I are going to sort of split the presentation up, and I'm going to start by uh, first kind of giving a broad overview of the immune system, but, but really focusing on what we're trying to uh, uh, achieve when we do testing of the immune system. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to her to kind of provide the, the meat of the presentation on the various immune tests, and then I'll come back for a short stint at the end to talk a little bit about genetic testing. I know there's a whole session or two on genetic testing, but I think increasingly that's an important part of the diagnostics that we're looking at when we think about immunodeficiency. So these are our disclosures. We both do some work with uh, companies uh, that either, that mostly develop treatments. I don't think we're really going to talk about treatment today. Um, so this is, uh, but, but for your information, there's that uh, disclosure info. All right, so just to start with a, a brief introduction, um, we know that when we're thinking of immunodeficiency, there's um, typically a clinical reason for that. There are symptoms or signs, infections or inflammation uh, that make us suspect that there is an immune problem. Uh, and so, as you well know, laboratory tests are at a very critical part of that evaluation so that we can uh, understand the diagnosis and then apply the, the appropriate treatment to try to improve the condition. Um, so there's a, the, everything that we talk about today, we have to sort of think of in the context of that uh, clinical presentation. And so uh, it's sort of obvious, I think, but this all starts with taking a good medical history, understanding the problem, and then doing um, physical examination to look for clues that may lead to the specific condition that we need to test for. And, and Vivian will talk a little bit about uh, the importance of age considerations so that laboratory tests also need to be interpreted in the context of the age of the patient. What's, what's normal for a 50-year-old is ne not necessarily normal for a 3-year-old. Um, so these are all important clinical factors. We never order tests or look at tests in a vacuum. Um, we always have to interpret them and order them in the context of what's happening with the patient. This slide I put up a little bit tongue-in-cheek, right? This is a ridiculously complicated slide. You're not supposed to be able to read all the, 
all the boxes here and all the words. Um, but I'm trying to make the point, which again is probably quite clear to all of you, that the immune system is incredibly complicated. Um, and uh, we, we don't claim to understand probably a fraction of everything that's going on in the immune system. Uh, I would say the immune system is the most complicated organ in the human body because it touches all the other systems. Um, so th that's one of the challenges we have as immunologists uh, is to try to uh, test and interpret te uh, those tests in the context of all this complexity that's happening uh, in the human immune system. And so we try to honestly dumb it down a little bit, right? We, we try to look at the immune system in chunks, in pieces, uh, and again, much of what we, the clinical history we take is trying to focus which piece should we be concerned about or which piece says in the case of combined immune deficiencies. So again, this is overly simplified, but just to point out, um, people that have problems, problems with severe fungal or viral infections or opportunistic infections, we think about the T cells of the immune system. Antibody defects usually lead to recurrent bacterial problems, often in the, the lungs and the sinuses. Um, specifically, there are types of viruses like herpes viruses. If that's the infection that keeps showing up in very severe fashion, we think of the natural killer cell part of the immune system. Uh, and then there's a whole host of other uh, immune components, uh, uh, neutrophils, the complement system, um, uh, the innate immune system that, again, that if there's a defect, you're going to see specific patterns of infection. So we try to break it down into digestible pieces and we direct our tests at those specific um, uh, pieces of the immune system. This is just another way to look at it. So uh, again, you've probably seen this before, but down the left side of this slide are what we call the cellular part of the immune system. And these literally are the different cells. So uh, there are what we call innate parts of the cellular immune system. These are cells that are sort of pre-programmed to do one thing, and they do that over and over again. It's a more primitive part of the immune system, we think, but that includes neutrophils and monocytes and natural killer cells and antigen-presenting cells like dendritic cells. There are also cells that are quite adaptive. They're flexible. They're plastic. They learn as, as we live what to react to and what to, uh, when to calm down. So that's mainly the T cells as a cellular adaptive part of the immune system. On the right side of the slide is something we call the humoral immune system, or this is the, the, the blood part of the immune system. And this, again, can be broken down into what we consider innate, which is a very sort of simple pattern recognition system, um, versus adaptive, where again, the immune system is learning to react and morph into, into ways that will protect you. So the, the innate, an example is the complement system, a series of proteins that basically punch holes in bacteria or label bacteria to be taken out. Uh, and then the adaptive immune system, we deal with this a lot. This is B cells and antibodies. Th those cells can adjust over time, um, but we consider that part of this humoral or bloodborne part of the immune system. So again, just, this is just to give you a framework of the different pieces. Um, when Vivian talks about specific tests, they're going to be targeted at some component on this grid here, some part of the immune system. And I like pictures. I'm sort of a you know simple guy. I like to see um, cartoons. So I thought this was cute. This this actually shows though all these cells that we're talking about. They're all quite different in terms of uh, how they're formed, what they look like, um, and what their jobs are within the immune system. So you can see you know you have helper T cells that really are the traffic cops. They're directing um, the immune system to do certain things. You've got cytotoxic T cells that, that really identify and kill um, cells that shouldn't be there. Regulatory cells that tell the immune system to calm down, stop, stop overreacting to things. And the plasma cells that make antibodies and the dendritic cells that present um, foreign particles to the immune system. So at any rate, understand that tests that we do are directed usually at one type of these cells looking at the function. And so that's why we, we have lots of different tests and we have to use those wisely because we want to pick the, the test that makes sense for the system that we're suspecting has a problem. Now, just to make it a little more complicated, we know that these cells change. 
Um, and so it's not just the cells, but there are proteins uh, and signals called cytokines in the immune system um, that tell a cell what it should be doing or what type of cell it should be evolving into. And so you can see here's a monocyte, which is a very sort of uh, simple cell, but it's actually through these cytokines changing into something called a dendritic cell, which has a, a different job in the immune system. And so it's not just the cells, it's the communication or the, the signaling between these cells um, and, and I don't think we're going to talk about it a lot, but we can measure cytokines sometimes, but we don't really know what that means in most cases. So there are lots of things that can be measured in the immune system, and one of the challenges we always face is how do you interpret that information? What does it mean for the person that is affected by uh, an immune deficiency? Um, and lastly, uh, I just want to, you're going to hear this over and over throughout the slides, but when we do immune testing, we think often in terms of quantity and quality. So that means, are there enough cells? Are there enough antibodies? We count the numbers. That's important. You'd like to be normal in that respect. But that's only a half the story. You, you, if you, have, you can have plenty of cells or plenty of antibodies, but if they're not doing their job, if the quality of that immune response is, is insufficient, you can still have significant problems with immune deficiency. So again, keep that in mind as, as Vivian walks you through some of the testing. We're interested in both of these things when it's possible to measure it, the, the, the quantity and the quality. I always tell people, you know, we want to know how full the gas tank is, but we also want to know what the octane of that fuel is. Both of those are important uh, for, for uh, making sure there's a normal immune response. All right, so very quickly, this is an old slide, but it still holds true. When we think of the different types of immune deficiencies, a large chunk of those have to do with that antibody system, the humoral antibody system. Uh, and probably 70 to 75% of all immune deficiencies have some issue with antibodies. So we spend a lot of time looking at those in clinical practice. But you can see there's also uh, cellular deficiencies. Again, these are usually the T cells. Uh, there's phagocytic disorders from neutrophils, for instance, uh, and then complement deficiencies. And again, when we're, when we're talking to patients, we try to break down which, which of these systems System seems to be a problem in terms of the history of infections, the types of infections, and so forth. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. It's always represented in the pie chart, but are antibodies themselves free of T cell defects, or, or is there always some yeah, it, it depends on the specific condition, but there are uh, instances where there's overlap. So for instance, a common variable immunodeficiency, which is we think primarily an antibody problem, but maybe a third of those patients have some T cell defect if you, if you really start to measure it carefully. So to your point, they're not, it's not always distinct separate categories. There can be some overlap. And, and as we've learned more, as people have, have been researching this, um, you, I, my point of showing this is that the, the universe of immune deficiencies is really expanding and exploding at some level. This has to do a lot with genetic testing and better molecular diagnostic techniques so we can actually say specifically that this problem is due to this molecular or genetic defect. But you can see there's over 300 different immunodeficiencies that have now been identified by scientists. And this is, makes it, you know, even more challenging. We have to think of all the possible tests to try to drill down on the exact diagnosis. I'm sorry this isn't in color. The, the public, when they published this paper, they did it in black and white. I wish it was color, so, but that's all we have. But it's just to show the, the huge um, increase in these types of conditions. Again, not because they're new conditions or diseases, but because we have better ways to test for them and, and clearly identify them. So you can see since the, really the late 1990s, there's been this upward tra trajectory in the terms uh, of immunodeficiencies. And this just breaks them out into these dis different systems I've been mentioning, antibodies, uh, the innate immune system, and so forth. Uh, and you can see really all of them have been growing in terms of our understanding of what causes these conditions. So lastly, before I, I finish this first section, uh, I'll just show you, again, we try to lump these conditions into specific categories. And this is really done based on the cells that are, are, are um, 
misbehaving, if you will, and the types of diagnostic tests that are used to make these diagnoses. Um, so the, the combined immunodeficiencies, there's a number of molecular causes for those. The antibody deficiencies, where some of them we know the, the molecular defect and others we don't. We, we simply have to rely on the antibody-based test to make them. Um, CGD, which is, a, a, of course, a neutrophil dysfunction or a phagocytic disorder. Um, and then there's other disorders that are really defined by the genetics themselves. There are a constellation of symptoms where an underlying gene defect has been identified. And the second page, we get even to ra into rarer problems. So innate immunity, autoinflammatory problems, complement deficiencies, uh, and then other types of immunodeficiencies. And for all of these uh, types of conditions, there are A, symptoms that are uh, found to be the hallmark uh, of those conditions. So that's what we, you know, people experience when they have them. We ask about or we see in the hospital. We get the medical history. Um, but as we're going to talk about, there are specific laboratory tests or diagnostic tests that really um, confirm that that's the problem and then allow us to pursue a course of treatment that should address, ideally address, the underlying immune issue or at least try to um, uh, alleviate some of the symptoms or prevent some of the complications of these, uh, of these immunodeficiencies. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vivian to talk more specifically about the tests. Um, please. Thank you, Mark. It's really a pleasure to be here with everyone today. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces, and I, I feel like one of the things I need to say just right off the, the bat is when we have whatever disease or disorder we may have, we don't come with that on our chest, right? It takes time. And as a parent, she, one of my children has epilepsy. Um, she doesn't have immune deficiency, but a chronic illness is a chronic illness, and sometimes it's hard to make the diagnosis. When you're the patient or the parent, it's very hard to be on that side. And I can tell you, even as your providers, it's hard for us, but we know that time is important. Um, and time is of the essence, which is one of the reasons why the Immune Deficiency Foundation, I feel, has made so many strides, not only with patient and family education, but also provider education, right? Because your primary care providers need to understand, you're coming to me with too many infections, you're coming to me with some autoimmune disease, there could be something wrong with your immune system. And I think I will say that that's very, very important. But um, what Mark just said about history, it really is the most important. We're training program directors. So what I tell my fellows when we walk into the room they will tell me the story, but I go in and I listen with what I call, you know, I don't put on blinders. I'm not an immunologist when I walk in the room. I'm a physician. I want to hear the story because sometimes it's putting the pieces together that will help us gather the information we need. When we do lab tests, which is what we're going to talk about, it's confirming what we're suspecting, right? One of the worst things we can do is do what I call random testing, and people do that. You don't want your physicians to do that. You don't want your providers to do that because you're going to come up with information that, A, we don't know what to do with, and, B, we're probably going to scare you unnecessarily and ourselves. I've, I see this a lot. So I'll, I'll, I will, you know, and a lot of times when I'm sitting with patients, I'll say this is our first visit, but this is the beginning of a journey. And our journey may be six months. Our journey may be ten years. But... There's no promises that anything is going to be obvious right from the beginning, but as I walk the journey with you, I promise you we will get to the bottom of it. And I think that that's just important to say from the standpoint of, um, you know, someone who has a child with a chronic illness. This is, this is not easy, but believe me, we're here with you, and I can speak for Mark and William that, that this is something near and dear to our hearts. Um, so obviously the workup is going to begin with screening tests, right? So the screening test, when you come to us, a lot of times patients will have some tests that were done by their primary care physician um, or provider. And, and I'll, I'll say most of the time it's not all the information we need because especially when you have children, I'm a pediatric immunologist primarily, I'll get handed labs and I need to make the diagnosis from that. And I'll say, unfortunately, this isn't everything I need. And you all know that, right? You, you, you walked this. So... The more information we can gather will also help whatever we're suspecting um, may be causing the particular signs and symptoms. 
Once we get back to screening labs, then we can do some more sophisticated tests. And as you're going to see, there's a lot of different tests. It's amazing the explosion of immunology in the last uh, 15 years that I've been practicing. The, the list, that, that last slide that you showed greater than 300, it, it was like 150. And because of different tests that we now have available, we have literally exploded. We've more than doubled in 15 years. Um, and obviously just following patients over time. I think that's the most important thing. This is something I spent a lot of time talking to people about. When you have normals or abnormal values, it's important especially because what, what Mark said, so number one, age is important. It's going to be totally different even in a one-month-old compared to a five-year-old, um, compared to a 50-year-old or a 90-year-old. Everyone's values are going to be different. When normals are developed, that's really coming from a group of healthy individuals. That's good and that's bad, right? Because you're going to have a little bit, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that bell curve. They try to, you know, basically do half and half, males and females. But I will tell you just from, I, I practice in South Florida, every ethnic group really does have different normal values, but we don't have those values. I'm sure you see that also, right? So it doesn't matter, you know, and, and it, I almost wonder if it's not just your whole genetic makeup, but your, your ethnicity does affect. And depending on, you know, this is just a random group of people. This is not necessarily representative of you. So what I'm trying to get at is sometimes you may have what is considered a low normal, but that's your normal, and it doesn't mean that it's abnormal. Does that make sense? <laughs> so I kind of said that long-winded, but um, <laughs> unfortunately. What we use um, for most of for our normals, or many of our normals, is a bell curve. So you're, there's going to be that group in the middle, the 65%, and then it goes out to what's left of 2.5% on one end low, 2.5% one end high. Remember that that 5% at one point was part of a normal population who was healthy, right? So if you happen to fall on one of those ends, and that's what I tell patients too, we need to follow you with time. Why? Because again, it could be your normal, it could be something that's absolutely not right. So that's very, very important. Um, and then one value outside of the reference range doesn't mean anything. So the first thing I do, if I'm suspecting that someone has, let's say, agammaglobinemia, and I get, you know, the signs and the symptoms are consistent, and there's a very low G, of course we're going to start treatment. But if there's something that comes back and you're thinking, this doesn't make sense, the first thing we do as, as clinicians is repeat it. <laughs> because there are many times that there are lab errors. It's like everything, human error, there's lab errors, there's all kinds of errors. So I think that that's really, really important. That's the first thing that needs to be um, emphasized. And then if it is still abnormal, then we can go on to, to other more specific tests um, because that will help us. Now, as far as pediatric values, these are my twins that are now 13. They were a lot easier to handle at that age. <laughs> but I wanted to put a picture of something pediatric here. Um, the range of values really does, does differ. And, and I feel that one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing whenever I get back labs is I really am looking at what their normal value, what normal values were used. Because if it's not age appropriate, I will say probably 10% of the patients that I see, it's that the lab didn't use the correct age, which is great news, right? When you tell the parents that they hug me, they're so happy. But it's really important that when you're interpreting labs, you're making, you're ensuring that you're using the correct um, age appropriate like values. And, and we have, we have uh, resources that will, will give us age specific reference ranges. Um, as far as antibody deficiency, so what are the standard screening tests? Immunoglobulins, right? Everyone's heard about IgG, A, M, and E. Um, that's looking at quantity. So Mark talked about this. This is quantity. When we want to look at quality, how's your function? Well, that's looking at how you've responded to vaccines. And this is important because we have the ability to measure vaccine levels, and we have the ability, if we need to, to vaccinate with things like the, the protein conjugated um, uh, or even the, the, just the, the, the regular the carbohydrate antigen, so like either Prevnar or Pneumovax, or, and then we can challenge, and then we repeat levels. Uh, that's a whole nother talk, by the way, we're not going to get into, but it, sometimes it's hard to interpret those, those levels as well. But at least we can see, was there a good response? Was there at least a two to four fold response? And that's important to us. And that helps us also make, make the case of whatever the diagnosis may be. 
Um, and then if you have a vaccine, if you're given a vaccine, we can repeat titers four to six weeks later and see where are those titers and we can follow them again with time. And I think that's, that's very, very important. Sometimes patients have been immunized to some vaccines. Sometimes they haven't. Um, and, and I don't need to also tell you that we're living in a world now where, where a lot of people don't want to vaccinate, right? And that's becoming an issue in many parts of, of the country um, and many parts of the world for many reasons. But using vaccination will actually help us measure pre and post levels, and that helps us make the, the, um, the diagnosis. Sometimes you're able to respond to some types of antigens, but not others. You may be able to respond just without any problems or proteins like tetanus and diphtheria, but you're not able to respond to carbohydrates, which would be um, the pneumococcal. And the pneumococcal response, the true response to carbohydrate antigen does take longer. It's, it's not, when, when babies are born, this is another thing I, I spent a lot of time teaching pediatric residents. The reason we're able to vaccinate newborns hepatitis B and two and four and six month olds is that we have protein conjugated vaccines that your body recognizes and should respond to. And that's important. Um, okay, when you're on antibody replacement, let's say the diagnosis has been made or someone has started replacement therapy and then the question comes, well, should we stop it to see, am I getting better? Is my diagnosis resolved? Is it improving? This is a really difficult dilemma for, for, for many patients. So having a conversation with your immunologist is the most important. In some patients, it is not necessary to stop. In others, it may be because the diagnosis may not be clear or there was a question about when it was started, you were having recurrent infections, you weren't responding properly to the vaccines. That this is a conversation that just needs to occur between you and your immunologist, but it's an important one because in some cases we do in fact need to stop the, the replacement therapy. And in those cases, we're able to um, follow the patients four to six months, get, you know, obtain labs once again, and then see where, where we're at. We're going to shift a little bit now to lymphocytes. So I love the slide that, that Mark used. I haven't seen that one, but there are so many different types of lymphocytes, and they all wear different hats, right? They're, they're absolutely amazing. Um, and I think that when we can start with just the antibody titers, but lymphocyte subsets or T helper suppressor panels, or um, there's a lot of different ways to characterize these. We're basically just looking at different markers on the different types of lymphocytes. So we can look at B cells, T cells, NK cells. Um, T reg cells. There's a whole there's a whole list that we can look at, and we we do often look at these. The B cell is the lymphocyte that has the ability to make antibody, right? So that's important. That's the, that's your memory. That's the one that helps protect you from from infections. Now, if I have a two month old male with and let's say he's already had two ear infections or three ear infections, and we look at B cells, I'm already worried about something like XLA, right? Um, X linked AM. We look at the B cells because the B cells are usually absent at below 1%. Um, and that helps us. The, the immunoglobulins alone, especially at that age, would not, would not help us. As far as quantity and quality, and we, we've already talked about it, but with lymphocytes, it's the same thing. So we start with something very simple, like a CBC, which almost everybody on the earth is going to have a CBC at some point, right? They're going to look at your red blood cells. They're going to look at your white blood cells, your platelets. Um, there. I always, I, I tell, in, in the hematology world, everybody will look at neutrophils, which we also look at neutrophils. I'm going to talk a little bit about neutrophils, but I am like the, the lymphocyte queen. I want you to think about your absolute lymphocyte count. So you have your total white count, and we're looking at what's the percentage. That's like the big question, right? And as, as a pediatric immunologist, that's a, an important one. Um, flow cytometry is the the way that we're able to, it's the, it's the um, test that we're able to perform to look at the different types of lymphocytes. And then we want to look not only at the, the number, but we want to look at how they're working as well. So this is just a nice um, diagram that shows here, the, where, where these cells fall is really dependent on how big they are, and then how granular they are. And there's different, different things. But when we look at the quadrants, we'll know that the B cells are going to fall in, we don't have a, do I have a point? Yeah. 
So the B cells will fall in this quadrant, T cells are going to fall in this one, NKT, which is a particular type of cell, is going to fall in this one, and then your NK cells. And then as you can see here, we can also look at them based on size. When we want to look at function for lymphocytes, we're able to look at not only mitogens, which is how your cells respond to different um, things like uh, phytohemagglutin is one of them, but we can also look at your response to antigens, which includes tetanus and candida. And then basically, it's, this is a really important test because it tells us whether or not your cells divide and grow when they're exposed to these. And that, we also can measure things um, like release of cytokines, and that's important. I'm going to shift now to newborn screening, and this is the first time I've given a talk. This is a very appropriate that I'm able to give this talk here. This is the first time I can say that all 50, I know, all 50 states are screening. That's huge. That's huge. We won't pick on the people that were late. At least they came around. I'm so happy. Um, but this is a big deal. This is a very big deal because we're able to recognize these infants very early on in their lives, and we know that the earlier we transplant them, the better their outcomes. Um, really what newborn screening here is measuring is, is called TREX. They're um, T-cell receptor excision circles. They're little DNA molecules that are formed within T-cells in, um, in the thymus. And just, this is something I heard from actually Louise Marker a long time ago. What makes a T-cell a T-cell is the thymus. So if you don't have a, the thymus is a schoolhouse, right? The lymphocytes will go, and once they go through there, they get trained and they become T cells. If you have no thymus, you have no T cells. So disorders like complete DeGeorge, where you don't have a thymus, um, they're not able to form the T cells. So that's, that's really important. Normal infant blood sa samples are going to have one track per 10 T cells. Um, and that tells you just how important and how your body is, is producing T cells early in life. And then the nice thing about the dry, dried blood spots, it's like with the other types of newborn screening, whether it's PKU or, or the others, it really allows for automated testing. They're able to run thousands at a time, um, and it's done on a little tiny disc, so you don't need a lot of blood, which is beautiful. We're going to shift now to neutrophil disorders. So usually with these disorders, we need to look at a series of white blood cell counts. So it's a series of CBCs. And Sometimes it may be weekly or every other week or every three weeks or every four weeks, but we're looking specifically at the, here we are looking at the absolute neutrophil count. Um, so I take off my lymphocyte queen hat and I put on my neutrophil queen hat. But it's important because when you're starting to look at these um, cells, they're the ones that are going to help us distinguish between what type of, of immune deficiency you may have. And then obviously having a good review, a good pathology review of the smear, because we're not only looking at the, the numbers, but again, is something wrong with the way that they look? And that's, that's very, very important. We're going to talk a little bit about CGD. So with, with the neutrophil disorders, um, CGD relies on the um, ability of the neutrophils basically to create a reactive oxygen. And that is called the oxidative burst, which is exactly what we see the NBT is an older test. The test that we're using now is actually a flow test. Um, Dihydrorhodamine 1, 2, 3, it's got a fancy name, but it's a flow study. And it's looking at the oxidative burst of activated neutrophils, and it's using a specific dye. The DHR is very, very sensitive, and it's really become the standard in most labs um, here in the U.S. And then the best confirmation, obviously, is you know, further evaluation, uh, G mutation, if, if it's known. Shifting to complement, the standard screening test is really just the total complement. And it's important because if a patient has something like um, meningococcal meningitis, I, I, I always say, if you have meningococcal meningitis once, that's enough. You should have a CH50. You shouldn't have to get it twice. And unfortunately, sometimes that happens. They have to get it twice. But with something, a severe infection like that, one of the things we like to uh, discuss with, with residents that are in training or other clinicians is there are some infections that are bad enough that that should just trigger a test. And a total complement is a very easy and honestly inexpensive test compared to a lot of the other tests that are done. And it is life-saving. 
once the diagnosis is made, we can look at the specific components, right? Um, and and that's, that's very, very helpful. There's also rarer conditions. So there are, there are alternative pathways that are affected. Um, and there you can, we can screen with an AH50 instead of a CH50. Uh, and then we, again, we can look at different parts of the complement cascade, including the mannose binding lectin uh, pathway. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Mark for the genetic studies. All right, for the last few minutes, let's talk about genetic studies. And, and as everyone in here knows, we live in an exciting time in diagnostics because uh, genetic and molecular tests really do hold a lot of promise for transforming the way that we diagnose people and, and really understand what's happening in immunodeficiency. Um, so uh, let, me, let me just give you sort of a quick lay of the land, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, so there are many uh, immune deficiencies where we know the, the molecular problem and, and we can make a genetic diagnosis. And, and again, if you think back to that chart I showed at the beginning, those are really, many of those conditions, the 150 plus that have been described in the last decade, have been made on the basis of these types of tests. So th this is the wave of the future. Um, and. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to think about what's available and, and how we're going to be able to use this. Um, the, so let me say a couple of things first of all. The, the technology available to do gene sequencing has become better and better, as you probably know. We can do this faster. We can do it more, less, with less expense than we've ever been able to before. And so one of the things that I want to make clear is that the Technically, this could be done for everybody, frankly. I mean, it, we, I don't know if it's not really a joke, but we often say in medicine, it won't be too long before people are coming into our office and plunking down their whole genome sequence and saying, tell me what's wrong with me, doc, okay? So technically, you can get this done today for, I don't know, $1,000 thereabouts. That's not the problem. The problem is understanding what all or any of that means, and we have a very short list right now of things where we know what this mutation means or what this change in the genome means. And so it's really an interpretation issue that we're struggling with, and I think we'll, we'll probably struggle with that for a while um, because of the massive amount of information that comes from uh, sequencing an entire genome or what's called an exome, which is the, the important, we think, the important messaging out of the DNA. Um, so, again, the point of this slide is that we can do this now, technically, and we can do it at a reasonable cost, um, but, but in, in PID at the moment, and I'll speak for myself, and Vivian and I have talked about this a little bit, um, we really, uh, we think the most useful thing right now is what's called targeted gene panels. And these are really testing for genes that we know may cause immune deficiency uh, and really doing that based on the suspicion, again, of what we see in front of us, of what you tell us, what kind of symptoms you're having. So this is available commercially. Um, you see on this slide there's a few companies that do this. Um, and, and so getting this done, again, technically is not a problem. I will say we still struggle with insurance coverage sometimes, so that's another issue. These aren't terribly expensive tests, but they run hundreds of dollars. Um, and so it's not something that, you know, most people want to pay uh, on their own. So we still struggle a little bit with getting these tests covered. Um, but to give you an idea of what we're struggling with in terms of interpreting genetic material, how many people in here have read War and Peace? I'll put my hand down. I have not read it, but <laughs> some people have. Okay. Maybe, maybe 25%. So big book, right? I don't know how many pages it is, but I'm, I, I, I'm told that there's about 3 million letters in War and Peace. Okay. Now, you can think of DNA as really that. DNA is actually a sequence of bases, they're letters, basically, that tells your body and your immune system what it should be doing and, and, and sort of all that has to be transcribed or looked at. So if you look at the human genome, it actually is equal to a thousand volumes of War and Peace. So this is an 18-story building. If you took volumes of War and Peace, a thousand of them, it would be as high as an 18-story building, okay? So that, that's your genome, all the letters that are in that stack of books. Now, when we do genetics, or genomics, I should say, 
what actually happens is you shred all those books because you have to break the DNA into pieces so that you can actually sequence it and look at what the sequence says, okay? So if you don't know what you're looking for, if you don't really have any idea, if you're on a wild goose chase for a genetic cause of something, you literally have to sift through this pile, oops, sorry, this pile of information from a thousand volumes of War and Peace and look for the word that's misspelled. Look for the letter that's wrong, okay? That's, that's, the, that's the interpretation problem. And so I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. We hear in the news all the time, genomics, genomics, get your genome. That's all great. You can do it, but someone has to put this back together and figure out what's the one thing. And furthermore, guess what? Most conditions are probably not caused by one word being misspelled. They're caused by a variety, a combination of errors that, that happen at different places. So I'm not trying to be pessimistic. I actually think we're, we're quickly moving to an era where we should be doing genetic testing in a lot of conditions, especially on the immune system, where we, we, that's, that's our best chance to really nail down what's happening. But I want you to understand the challenges of, of the bioinformatics, the interpretation. I, I think the lay press is not right a lot of the time. They sort of make it sound like we're already there. We're not. We're not yet. Okay. Now, what is, what is more helpful, and this is more kind of my opinion, but I think a lot of my colleagues would agree, are these, again, targeted gene panels. So this is actually a test. It doesn't matter which company it's from, but this is a test where they actually sequence 207 genes that we know cause immune deficiencies, or at least have an influence on immune deficiencies. And so if, if I get this information, I know what to do with this. I, I'm familiar with these genes. There's some literature on what what it causes, the problem it causes. And what's really exciting about this is if you find something, it may actually change the treatment for some people. So this is just one study from a couple of years ago. There's many other studies going on looking at this sort of thing. But this was a group of, of CVID patients, common variable immunodeficiency patients. And again, they, they already had a diagnosis. But as, as you may know, people with CVID have a wide variety of problems. Uh, many of them have lots of autoimmune or GI issues. Some of them just get infections. But we've always suspected CVID is sort of a group of various conditions. So what these researchers did is they did, they did gene sequencing uh, uh, on these patients. And what I'll show you is, first of all, uh, less than half of them did they find a mutation that made sense for, for causing the condition. So, again, this is part of the problem. We, we look at what we know to look for, and it doesn't give an answer a lot of the time, and, and that's frustrating, but that's the reality. But for those people, so in the, on the right side, those different colored wedges of different um, mutations you see listed on the right list there, um, for some of those patients, so four different groups, it ends up being about 15 to 20 percent of the patients, it actually changed their treatment because we know there are targeted medicines, I listed them here in red, that actually better address that specific molecular problem uh, and, and lead to a much better quality of life and, and better symptom control for these patients. So not only can we identify the root of the problem, but there are instances now where that is actually changing what we do for the better. It's giving us more specific treatment. And, and so this is, the, this is the holy grail of pharmacogenomics, right? If I know your genome, I know which medicines to give you. It's only happening in certain instances now, but that's a glimpse at, at the hope we might have, is that our diagnostic tests, some of which you've heard of and some of which are genetic, will actually tell us that's the drug for you, that's the treatment for you. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then I'm going to end with one last uh, comment. And you heard a little bit about this before, um, but, but this is one of my pet peeves. So you're the queen of, uh, of lymphocytes. I'm the king of laboratory testing pet peeves or something. I don't know what it is. Here's my point. Um, for a lot of you or some of you who are on immunoglobulin treatment, when you're getting that treatment, it interferes with a lot of the routine tests that people like to do. Um, and so I see lots and lots of my patients who are getting immunoglobulin, they go to their internist, their family doctor, and I'm not picking on those docs, they're very good. Uh, they go to the infectious disease doctor, they go to the rheumatologist, they come back with a huge list of abnormal tests. A lot of these tests are based on antibody assays, so they're looking to see does your body make antibodies against something else to diagnose a condition. 
Well, of course, when you're getting immunoglobulin, those aren't your antibodies anymore. That's not your body making that. Okay. All you're measuring when you do those specific types of tests is what you're infusing in your arm or putting in your sub-Q tissue. Okay. So this is an educational thing. I'm telling you guys, because a lot of times my patients have to tell their doctors, you know, if you send my, you know, my antibodies to tetanus or my, uh, my ANA or my autoimmune panel, uh, you're really measuring those thousands of donors that got, I got my IgG from, not me. Um, so you have to, docs have to really be uh, more clinical. You can't rely so much on the tests. Um, and so that, that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. We talk about diagnostic testing. Treatment sometimes can influence certain tests that doctors are looking at. All right, so um, as was said, I think, at the beginning, um, just remember anything we said today is sort of general information, but in terms of testing that you should have done um, or testing that you want to pursue, that's, of course, something that you have to talk to your personal specialist or doctor about because it, it's all based on your personal symptoms and your personal situation. Um, so we, we put up here a reference. Um, I think we're, we're actually in the process of revising this uh, patient handbook. Um, I don't know if there's a release date on that yet, but um, I think this is going to be a nice resource. It'll cover, cover some of the things we talked about today. So if you didn't get all the notes today, there'll be a nice handbook coming out, hopefully in the next few months, to, to help with that. Um, and then I think that we can uh, take some questions if we have some. I'm giving you the hard ones. <laughs> do you want to start or do you want me to? You can start. So here's a question. How often should you have blood work for updates? Uh, so again, I don't know that there's a, uh, you know, a hard and fast rule here. I think um, Vivian said it earlier, there are a lot of times where we see something that's sort of abnormal um, and how often we relook at that or reassess really mostly depends on how the person is doing. Um, so th it is... I would, I would add into that, you're probably going to need an every six month lab series to keep your insurance company happy because otherwise... Yeah. So, so I guess there's, there, I, I, would, I would say there's two questions here. One is for diagnosis, right? So in somebody where you're you, you know, you're suspicious, but the labs are maybe borderline or a little bit abnormal. So that's where I say it depends on the clinical scenario. We, we often do. I have a, a group of patients we're, fo we're not treating at the moment. We're following to kind of see where things go if they're not terribly sick. Um, so that's, you know, that's based on the judgment of the, of the clinician. But I agree with you. If you have a diagnosis and you're on treatment, particularly related to immunoglobulin treatment or something else where your insurance company is you know, wants to sort of make sure it's tracked. Um, typically every six months is kind of what I hear a lot, and I think that's totally reasonable. There may be reasons to do it slightly more often if you're adjusting dose or starting new medications, but, but I think, um, you know, every six months is a good rule of thumb to start with. Okay, I have CVID and was told I need to have the Tdap shot in order to visit my nephew, my newborn great-niece, is this accurate? So. If you're not on replacement therapy, on gamma globulin replacement therapy, then the answer is yes, you really should. Uh, I think honestly most adults probably need to be revaccinated, and we know that pertussis is very dangerous to, to newborns. Um, but if, you are on, if you're on replacement therapy, you should not need, because you should be protected. Uh, here's a question. Have any epigenetic factors been linked to PI? It's a that's a good question. Um, like most good questions, I don't have a good answer for it. Um, so the, the answer, to my knowledge, is no one's really been looking closely at that yet. I don't think we can say much about epigenetics. Like I said, I think we're still um, 
for a lot of conditions, we're still trying to nail down the actual molecular defect. But um, to, as, as this questioner points out, this is a whole other realm of investigation is it may not just be the sequence of the gene, but all the things that surround the expression of that gene or what happens after the protein uh, is made by that gene. So this field of epigenetics and also modifier genes. So it's not just the gene that, that produces a protein or a response, but there are other genes that influence or regulate how that gene works or is expressed. So it's extraordinarily complicated, um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not doing it justice, but I think the short answer is no. I, I don't think anybody's really worked out epigenetics for, for PI. This is a really good question because I've had this question before from patients. Can you still have C. diff if the stool molecular test is negative and only vancomycin works? And when on vanco, there's no symptoms, and symptoms come back off of vanco? And... I would say yes. The answer is yes. Um, there are different types of tests for C. diff, too, so I'm not exactly sure what particular test was done, but I will say that there are some patients that C. diff, I consider it like a colonizer in a carrier state in some patients. And when you're not, you know, if you're symptomatic when you're not on the vanco, but you're better on vanco, then the answer is yes. That's a very good question. Yeah, and I think because we're talking about diagnostic tests, to your point, the the older tests look for the toxin produced by C. diff, which is not perfect. Um, I think there are newer tests looking at the molecular diagnosis, which are actually quite sensitive. And the, the caveat to that question is I have had patients that tested positive for C. diff on these molecular tests but had zero symptoms. And so to your point, it, it, it may hang out in the gut and not cause any problems in some people, in which case we don't get too carried away with, with treatment unless they're symptomatic. So again, you always have to look at the tests in context of how's the person doing, what symptoms are they having. Um, this question says, is PANDAS uh, considered a primary immune deficiency? I'll take a stab at this, but then punt to you. Um, my understanding of, of PANDAS, and I don't see a lot of it myself, is that it's probably more better characterized as an autoimmune problem. Um, there's an immune response that has sort of gone off target and is starting to cause um, generally neurologic problems. But you, you may have more experience with this. I actually don't have much experience, but I think PANDAS is something that's going to evolve over time. We're learning more and more about it. Um, and I would agree with you. I, I don't consider it a primary immune deficiency, but clearly something is not right, and it probably is more autoimmune. It's a response, your body's response to, and, and many of the, there's some pediatric patients that do present with just changes in behavior and, and neurologic symptoms. But this is really a story that's unfolding. Um, there are some, very few, but there are some panda specialists throughout the country and, and they're the ones that are going to give us the best information so that we'll be able to help. Um, okay, should a test be redone if the T cell response test results stated that proliferative response to candida is not reported, and I'm not sure why that would happen, um, when tetanus toxoid was normal? So there are two different tests. So if there's a question, I would say it probably should be reported. This is something definitely to discuss with your immunologist. Um, and does being on IVIG impact the results of total complement? No. Not that I know of. Yeah. This is a question that comes up quite often. How long do you have to be off Ig treatment if you're going for a new immune workup? And again, th I would say this relates specifically to the antibody levels and antibody function because, we, as we just said, we don't think immunoglobulin probably influences a lot of the other parameters we're looking at. But if you're looking at antibodies, of course it does. Um, so I, I, my answer would be a, a minimum of three months and probably closer to six months to get the, the cleanest picture. And again, that in my experience, that depends on the clinical scenario. If you have somebody that's been off for three months and they're getting very sick, I'm going to try to push and do the test earlier and hope that I, I get the answer to the question. Uh, if, you know, if they're doing okay off the treatment, then we might wait a little longer um, to get the, the cleanest picture possible. So a uh, minimum of three, but preferably closer to six. Totally agree. Do you have any patients with selective IgA deficiency that are ill all the time? Any of them on IVIG and did it help? So 
one one thing I, I, I think about selective IgA deficiency, it's, it's another diagnosis that I feel we're learning more about because as you know, for some patients it's not just selective IgA, later on it, it could evolve into or become more clear that it's common variable. In children, it's even more difficult, in very, very young children, because IgA can take a few years to really come in. So selective IgA deficiency, I, you know, it can be three, four years before you can say, is this really selective IgA deficiency? I don't have any of them on IVIG. Um, what I do think helps many of those patients is aggressive antibiotics as soon as they get sick, and many of those patients may or may not be on prophylactic antibiotics. Again, that's going to depend on who your immunologist is. And then just following, again, it's following because selective IgA may only be selective IgA or it may be something else. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's really important to look for other cofactors. So, uh, you know, functional antibody problems um, and sometimes the selective IgA deficiency does evolve into something more, you know, more significant than that, I guess. I do have some um, patients that have been quite sick with selective IgA deficiency, and we always do these additional tests. We follow them. We look for allergy problems because it's actually quite common, and that can complicate things, so we make sure we're not missing some other issue. I have, um, I, I tend to agree with you about the antibiotics. I have very rarely had patients where we decided to try IVIG. Now again, understand that doesn't do anything for the IgA deficiency. Um, we're just trying to compensate for that by increasing the IgG levels. Um, and, and I would say it, it seemed to help those couple of patients that, that were on it. It is difficult to get it covered um, because insurance companies, uh, and, the, and they're correct, we don't have much data on this for uh, Ig replacement and selective IgA deficiency. So it, it's not an easy road, but again, depending on how sick a person is, you can make a reasonable case that that, that should be um, considered. I think I'll just say something about being your own advocate if you have someone in your family who's affected by PID, um, being that person's advocate. Everybody needs an advocate. Every patient needs an advocate. If you're sitting here today or someone's listening in the future to our lecture and you don't have a diagnosis, that's very frustrating. When I say time, time helps, it does help. I think talking to your immunologist, talking to your healthcare team, talking to the nurse practitioners with a lot of experience, and gaining more and more information. And, and I can say I'm 15 years, so I'm pretty young in the field. I've seen a lot of immunodeficiency, but there's a lot I haven't seen. I reach out to people all the time. I have mentees that reach out to me. I could reach out to Mark about a patient. That I, I reach out to Mark Ballow about patients, and I think the beauty of immunology is that we're a tight-knit community. You are not walking this journey alone. We are not walking it alone with you. We are walking it with you. And a lot of times it's just having the advocate, whether it's you, your family member, your immunologist, saying something's not right, we haven't gotten to the bottom of it, and you keep trying and trying. And believe me, we're here to help you with that. I can honestly say that from all of my colleagues and that we are a tight-knit community. We don't have all the answers, but we are here to walk the journey with you. So please know that you're not alone. We good? Thank you. Yeah, I wanted, and just a, a you know, shameless um, plug for the, for the IDF. Remember that the IDF is here for you and is connected very deeply into the immune deficient community and the community of immunology providers. So please, um, you know, visit our website, use our resources. As Mark said, there is a new version of the um, uh, handbook that's coming out, and it's really quite extensive. If you want to get a peek at what's coming the, at the table, they've got a list of the chapters that are there, so it's really going to be much more extensive than um, has been in the past. So that resource will be there. And again, the, the IDF is really here for you. So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Mark and Vivian for um, their, their time and their energy. And um, have a great rest of the conference, and I guess we'll see everybody in zebra stripes uh, later on tonight. <laughs>